Audio Frontier. Hello and welcome to the One Last Match podcast. It's the podcast that allows ex-footballers the chance to replay their last game on their own terms. I'm Mark Benstead and every week we'll have a former hero of the game on the show to talk about the team that they would put together, the opposition they'd like to face and who they'd like to have in the dugout. This week it's the turn of former Arsenal, West Ham, Celtic and Wales striker John Hartson. But first, I need to tell you about our sponsors, Who Knows Wins. Who Knows Wins are changing the way that you enjoy sport. It's the social sporting app that allows you to make your predictions in a league against your friends, family, colleagues, anyone. It's real money on the line. Or you can join one of their public leagues as well and pit your wits against the Who Knows Wins community, which is over 10,000 members. You can download the Who Knows Wins app on the App Store or Google Play and get a piece of the quarter of a million pounds that's been won so far. So put your money where your mates are and Who Knows Wins. Yeah, but let's kick off one last match now with the one and only John Hartson. Okay, welcome to the latest episode of One Last Match, the show that gives our favourite former players the chance to reimagine the ends to their fabulous careers as we give them the perfect send off, the perfect final game. They pick the stadium, they pick the teammates, they pick the opposition, they get everything their own way. The guest on this episode is a man who was the most expensive teenager in British football. He broke the transfer record at four of his former clubs. He was a man who scored in the Cup Winners' Cup final, fired his team to the UEFA Cup final, won three Scottish Premiership titles, did pretty much everything, and a whole host of caps for his country. It's former striker John Hartson. John, great to have you, Thank you. with us on the show. Um, we'll get to your dream finale in a second, but take us back to your actual final game. Do you remember that the point when you had to, to call time on your career? Yeah, well, I became, I became quite ill, unbeknown to my knowledge. I was, I was carrying cancer and I got a little bit sluggish. I was out of the team at West Brom. <clears throat> uh, Brian Robson uh, took me to West Brom, signed me on the same day as Kevin Phillips, brought me down from Celtic, and he brought Kevin Phillips from Aston Villa. And we did initially, did, did quite well initially, and then Brian Robson lost, lost his job. And then Tony Mowbray came into West Brom, and um, Tony Mowbray, he wanted to play a different setup, if you like. He, he, he told me early on that he wasn't really going to use me that much because uh, he liked quick, mobile strikers. I thought that completely rules me out, you know, almost straight away. And he had a lot of respect and he had a lot of time for me when he was manager of Hibernian up here in Edinburgh um, when he used to come and play against Celtic. Myself, I was playing for Celtic. And um, my career almost then sort of fizzled out, if you like. Uh, I'd become quite unfit. The warm-ups became like almost like fully blown training sessions. It became really, really demanding. Uh, Tony liked his players to be really, really fit. It's five or six years ago, I'd have coped easily enough, but I was starting to think of retirement, 32, 33. I was, I was always a big guy, put a bit of weight on, and um, I went through a divorce as well. I was missing my kids. Um, so the end was pretty near, and unbeknown to my knowledge, I was also carrying cancer. Um, so that was pretty much the end. I finished at West Brom. I had a little three or four weeks on loan at Norwich, but um, West Brom was my last club in terms of, I can say, 32, 33 years of age. Um, I was pretty much done. I was pretty much done. What are your memories of the final game, the final time you, you walked out for, for a match after such a, a fantastic game? We touched on all the successes. Yeah, well, I, I didn't know, Mark. I, I didn't know that um, it was on loan for Norwich and it was Burnley away in the game that we beat. We got beat 2-1. It was in the Championship and I started as a sub and I uh, came on in the second half. And, um, and then West Brom called me back from that initial three or four weeks, month, one month spell on loan. And then it just finished. I think they, they, we did a deal. Um, I went and worked for Satanta Sports then, straight into the media. I would signed a two-year contract with Satanta. Um, and basically that was it. But um, I, I didn't know, maybe if I'd known, I'd have probably made a bit more of it. Told the lads, <laughs> and maybe told my family so they could, I could say, look, this is my very last game. You know, I've made over 500 appearances mm. and most of them had been at the highest level in the Premier League for teams like Arsenal, West Ham, Wimbledon, Coventry, Celtic, all these brilliant football clubs that I played for. Um, so maybe if I'd known, 
I'd have made more of it. But the fact that I didn't know it was going to be my last game, and um, maybe that was a good thing in the end because um, I didn't have much time to think about it. Uh, that's, that's, that's quite different to most footballers. Most footballers know it's the, the final game. They can get the head around it. Mm. Was there a point where it hit you and you realised, oh, I'm not a footballer anymore? Well, no, not really, because I, I got a bit tired with it all. Um, people say to me, do you miss football? And I'm like, well, do you know what? I've, since finishing football, I've, I've set up the John Hartson Foundation. I've done very well in the media. You know, I've worked for the BBC and I've been doing lots of co-commentaries. I'm currently with BT Sport and I write columns and I've got five children. I live here in Edinburgh and I'm, I'm in a really good place in my life. You know, I'm, I, I, the thing I miss about football is I, I miss being competitive. I miss letting off a bit of steam, if you like, on a weekend, you know, that contact. Um, and that's what I miss. I miss the occasion, you know. I, you can't not miss playing in front of 60,000 people at Celtic Park, you know, it's it's an incredible place to play your football and luckily for me I had five years there, very successful, they played in a great team and a brilliant, two great managers, Strachan and O'Neill. Um, but I, I don't really miss it now because I've, I've filled my time with other things, I'm 44 years of age. Um, I'm probably more than halfway through my life. I didn't think I was making 32, never mind 44. So um, to me, I don't take myself too seriously. Um, I enjoy every day. I enjoy this beautiful fresh air that we suck in. I enjoy time with my family and my children. Uh, precious time when they're growing up. And um, as I said, I, I, I don't miss it too much, to be honest, because I, I work on it as well. So. But the playing side was great while it was there, while it lasted. But um, to answer your question, um, I don't really miss playing anymore. It's brilliant to hear you. you're so content with life just now. But indulge us, we'll, we'll reimagine a final game for you to give you the send off to, to the career you had. We give you the choice of all the options to, to plan it out perfectly. If you had to pick one stadium, all the ones you played at through your career, to have one final goodbye, which would it be? I guess it might be the one you've just mentioned, but go on. Well, it could be the one I've just mentioned, and it, it could be other clubs that I played for. But um, I have to say, the one game that really broke my heart was the defeat against Russia in the playoff. It was, I remember it was November the 15th. It was a Tuesday or a Wednesday night. We'd gone to Russia, we'd gone to Moscow in a playoff um, for the 2004 uh, European Championships which took place in Portugal. And we'd had a great start. We'd won our first ga four games under Mark Hughes. We're sitting on 12 points. Italy were in our group. We beat Italy in Cardiff. Famous night, 72,000 people at the Principality Stadium, which was the Millennium Stadium at the time, it changed its name. And um, we got to 12 points very early. We stumbled then over the line. We finished second to Italy. We go into a playoff against Russia to go to Portugal. And Wales hadn't been in a major tournament for, at the time, it was 50 years or something. They did it in 2016 under Chris Coleman. Did very well. Um, so I'm going to say it would be um, November the 15th, a Tuesday night, in Cardiff. It was the second leg. We'd got a nil-nil in Moscow. We bring them back to Cardiff, we're favourites. It was an um, unbelievable night. And we lost 1-0. And a lot of us thought that we'd already done it. We were counting our bonuses on the flight coming home, um, the players' pool, what we were getting between us all. And um, it was a very close game, and we got beat 1-0. And I probably never felt a defeat. Um, I'd had lots of defeats, lots of great moments, lots of wins, but quite a few, you know, not so nice defeats, losing last minute cup finals and that goal in the Cup Winners Cup final you mentioned I scored in Naeem, last minute of extra time, it's going to penalties, I'm taking a penalty. So that was a you know losing last minute to Motherwell when we almost won the league. Mm. They scored two late goals, the the helicopters got the SPL trophies hovering above the ground and it's off to Hibernian where Rangers had beat Hibs. Rangers picked it up that year. So um, several things are that, but the Wales defeat, because I'm a proud Welshman and I speak the language and we'd had a great run under Mark Hughes. Our, our front three was Giggs, Hearts and Bellamy for the most of the time under, under Mark Hughes. Um, Gary Speed, God rest his soul, was a regular in that team. Robbie Savage did ever so well. Mark Delaney, Paul Jones in goal. And we got beat 1-0 and I, it really hit me hard, if I'm being honest. So if I could name one particular game I'd, write, I'd like to play again, it would be on that 
horrible night. I say horrible night, horrible result. It was a great evening, but it's only great if you win. You know, you learn that as players. Players will tell you they play in cup finals. You've got to win them. If you don't win them, it's just another ordinary game, really. Um, and we got beat 1-0. Uh, Russia went through. We uh, we failed to qualify, which was devastating for us. I say devastating in football terms. Just, you know, you should never put that word with football. But it was very, very uh, upsetting evening for everybody. The crowd thought we were there. I thought we were there, the players thought we were there. So it was against Russia um, and it was the Millennium Stadium 2003 uh, to go through to Portugal and the, the Euros in 2004, of course, um, and we failed ultimately. So if I had to say one stadium, one group of players, if there was a, if there was a night I'd like to replay and recall, I'd have to go back to that one. How long did it take to, to get over that defeat? Because obviously it meant so much to you, so proud yeah. to represent your country, and that was the, the opportunity that perhaps wouldn't come along again for Wales. I'm still not over it, if I'm being honest. Um, I don't think you ever get over something like that. You know, for, for clubs, you, you have another season. You know, you have another, um, another cup competition, things like that. You have another final. But I think for your country, and we hadn't been there for so long, and Mark Hughes, he had us all work into a T. We all functioned so well. The win against Italy was special um, in Cardiff. Um, so I, I think back and I think, you know, I, I probably, I've never got over that, you know, losing that night. Um, and when I go and I, I watch the Welsh lads doing so well, the Gareth Bales and the Ramses and these players now, I'm very proud of the lads and I'm delighted for them. But. Uh, when I watch these guys playing in the European Championships, I'm, I'm a little bit, well, oof, what a moment that must be for the lads. And it's something for your country that you've always got with you. You know, you can take it away and you represented your country with, you know, with distinction, if you like. I was always very proud to wear that number nine shirt. Ian Rush, Mark Hughes, Dean Saunders, all these guys had worn it before me. Um, so that was the one. So when you say how long did it take, you know, listen, I don't lay in bed at night, every night and think, oh God, I wish I'd, you can't change what's happened. You cannot change the past. You can't bring anything back. It's gone, it's finished with, but there's still a little bit inside me that thinks, uh, God, I really wish I could have qualified for that tournament. That's perfect then. We've got, we've got the, the setting for your game. We've got the opposition now as well. You've jumped ahead. You've given us that, who you want to beat in that game. Yeah. We'll get to your actual start in 11 shortly, but in terms of the journey to the game, if there was a guy who you played alongside, who you could have on the bus alongside you for that final game, someone maybe who doesn't have to play in the team, but is just someone who was either great on the bus or just great to have alongside mm -hmm. you in a dressing room, who do you think you'd pick? Again, that is so difficult because I'm doing an injustice to so many players, you know. Um, the likes of Henrik Larsson at Celtic, he, he was a genius and Henrik used to get us out of jail every week. He scored ridiculous goals in European. And he played at every level for his country, he was, a, he was a legend. He left Celtic and went to Manchester United. Then he won the Champions League um, at Barcelona, an uh, incredible player. So a lot of Celtic fans would expect me to probably say Henrik alongside me to count on him when he needed a goal. Um, Tony Adams was an incredible leader at Arsenal. I learned a lot from Tony. The way that he dealt with his problems as well, his drinking and everything else, and the way that he set up you know, the Sporting Chance Clinic and he's helped thousands of young footballers. He's done so much work that people don't even know how much work that he's done. Um, by getting himself sorted out and getting himself clean. I think he's 27 years or something now. He hasn't had a drink. Inspirational character, a wonderful leader of men, a natural leader of men. Um, brilliant m mountain on the pitch, a man mountain. An incredible captain of Arsenal, captain of England. And when you listen to other England internationals, top, top players, the way they speak about Tony Adams as well. Everybody loves Tony and uh, admires him and respects him. Um, if I had to say one, I'd have to go with Henrik. I'd have to go with Henrik because although me and Henrik, we weren't, I wouldn't say we weren't close, we, we, were, we were close, but when we played together, we were very tight, but we didn't really mix outside of the football. Um, you know, I wouldn't have thought that Salah mixes with 
Henderson. <laughs> you know what I mean? They've got their own mm. sort of, and that's that's natural. Um, but uh, when we played together, we you know we linked up very well, and you could always if Hendrik went through, you knew he'd score. You could almost turn around and run back to the halfway line. He was a phenomenal player. So to have him, and again, I played with Ryan, I played with Giggsy, you know, I played with Craig Bellamy, Ian Rush, Mark Hughes, these great players. Um, Ian Wright, Dennis Burkamp was phenomenal at Arsenal. So I'm doing a lot of people um, a, a disservice, really. It's a really difficult question. But I'd have to go the King. I'd have to go Henrik Larsson. If I needed somebody there, well, I could nod one down, he'd go through and he'd win us the game. And he was very humble, very uh, decent person. So I'd have to say Henry Glasson. Okay. Henry gets a seat on the bus next year. You're heading to the ground, you know where you're I going. I actually sat at the back, Henry <laughs> sat on the front. <laughs> <laughs> well, we dig the bus for this he fun. he didn't like playing cards. <laughs> was, we had a little card school, but Henry was with uh, Johan Albi and Magnus Hedman and you know. Do you never get him involved at the back? Yeah, and it would come up and have a chat, you know, on the long journeys and stuff like that. I'd walk down the front, the manager, Martin, would come up and see all the lads. We used to have a big bus with tables and everything, and some of the lads are on their games and whatever they're doing, and we used to have a little card school, me, um, Neil Lennon, Chris Sutton, Alan Thompson, Jackie McNamara, John Robertson, Martin O'Neill's assistant manager, Rob was <laughs> a great character. Rob would always be playing cards. Um, so he's to their own, whatever, you know, whatever sort of fills the time and everything else, you know, but uh, they were generally, but Henrik would often come in and, you know, and, and get involved in conversations and stuff, but uh, you could always count on him. So we've got you going to play, John. We know who's on the bus alongside you. We know the opposition now. Who do you want in the dugout, though, of all the, the great managers you, you worked under, George Graham, Arsene Wenger, Bruce Riot, Gordon Strack and Martin O'Neill. Yeah, it is. It's that last one you mentioned there. It, it would have to be Martin O'Neill, I think, um, Harry Redknapp, um, John Toshak, Mark Hughes, uh, Brian Robson, uh, all these great men, great managers. Um, I would probably have to say uh, Martin O'Neill. I'll tell you why, because he took a chance on me when I failed four medicals, I failed four big medicals. One at Rangers, Spurs, Charlton, and first time around at Coventry. There was something showing up on my knee, which put clubs off, um, paying the wages, paying the transfer fee. Um, and I failed four medicals. I, I would have been one of the few people to have gone West Ham, Arsenal, Spurs. Um, under George Graham again, who'd already took me to Arsenal. George was manager at Spurs. Failed the medical anyway, um, but Martin O'Neill, he showed a bit of faith in me and, and I came back with 110 goals for him and uh, you know he was he was fantastic with me he was he was very um, very strict with me I had to work hard you know which is he kept on top of me I said I had to work hard working hard is a must anyway but he kept on top of my weight if I was a little bit over he'd get the physios to make sure I got it off I'd run before the rest of the other players came out I'd go on a treadmill so I had to be right, uh, I had to be right mentally as well to play in that team because it was a wonderful team. If you weren't, you basically were out of the team. If you played well, you kept the shirt. If you trained and did the right thing, you played. You played every game in Europe and in the league. There was none of this chopping and changing, um, sort of like teams do now where they change teams mm. willy-nilly three games a week teams changed three times under martin o'neill it was three games a week and we'd be lucky if we made one change mm. players didn't want to players didn't want to have a rest it's momentum you know it's it's you, you you're driven all the time um that's how we managed and as i said i i, I always felt if you were in martin's team you know you you, you felt privileged you know you, you're speaking then about martin and <clears throat> the demands he put on you not mm. all managers when they did that to a player, wouldn't it wouldn't be received well by some players. How, how did he make it so you were you bought into that? Well, first and foremost, I owed him because uh, I failed four medicals. So straight away, I'm thinking, Martin's put his faith in me here. He's gone out. He spent six million pounds for me for a player that four clubs thought about but didn't take because of the because of the risk. For me, there wasn't a risk. But when you look at medicals, um, and it was such a huge amount of money, you know, we, we're talking 20 years ago here, we're talking 90, 100 million now, this is what this, this 
the money would have been mm. in now day and age. Um, so it's a package. It's an overall four or five year deal. Martin had no qualms. He had no issues. He knew he had faith in me to come back with the goals and the performances and to help that great team. Um, and I had to be on song, I had to play well, and uh, it kept me on my toes. It kept me on my toes, both off the field and, and on the pitch as well. Um, fantastic friend. Um, know him a lot better now than what I ever did when I played under him because uh, he never really let you get too close to him, although he was a, he was a genuine, honest guy. Um, that's how he managed, and it, it, it worked for him. Uh, so. I would have Martin O'Neill in the dugout because I know he'd get the best out of me. But again, Harry Redden have got the best out of me. Uh, Mark Hughes built, you know, he said to me, John, you're number nine. You know, Giggs, Bellamy, players around you, second balls. Everything came into me, you know, that focal point. Um, and again, the likes of John Toshak. I loved working with Arsene Wenger. George Graham paid a lot of money for me. Um, so there's probably four or five there I've left out as well. But um, if I had to say one, simply because I know that I would have got myself right for that game, that one last game, it has to be Martin, Martin O'Neill. So you, you mentioned you, were, you, you, know, you played under Arsene Wenger. You were there across the kind of transition at Arsenal, which went from the, the George Graham era through to Arsene. He wanted you to stay. Why how did you find that time and why did you decide to, to kind of ultimately move on? Well, I wanted to play every week. You know, to my credit, I wanted to play. I felt I was good enough to play um, and I didn't want to sit on the bench. I thought it's a short career. You get 10, 12 years at this if, if you're lucky. Um, some get longer, look after themselves. Some are not big lumps. Some are quite small, thin, don't carry weight, can glide off challenges. I'm battling, getting hit every week. Bang, and two back operations, you know, challenging aerial challenges against your Razor Ruddocks and your Martin Keowns and your Colin Hendrys and these big monster centre halves. So I'm thinking I've only got 12, you know, years, 13 years. I want to get in the national team. Rush, Hughes, and Saunders were coming to their, you know, the end of their international days. And I wasn't playing. I wasn't playing regular. And I felt I should have been playing regular, uh, even though it was right in Burkamp. Um, I, was, I was confident in my own ability. And then Harry Redknapp came in and offered me, um, offered me a chance to go and be the, the number nine, well, I played number 10 for West Ham. You know, that, that focal point, that out and out striker. He said he would build his team around me. He was signing Paul Kitson. We had good players um, at West Ham. Young Rio Ferdinand, Frank Lampard were coming through. Then uh, Joe Cole as well, Michael Carrick, Defoe, all them. They were kids at the time, we could see they were going to be great players. Um, and I went to West Ham. I left Arsenal with three years left on my contract in 1997, and they won the double in 98. <laughs> what a good decision that was. <laughs> but um, if I'd stayed, I'd have had all these double winners' medals and God knows what. And I saw Thierry Henry at the World Cup a couple of years ago, and I was in the same sort of studio as him, and I, I remember saying to him, Thierry, one of your biggest regrets at Arsenal must have been you never got to play with me. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he looked at me as if to say, yeah. But no, he, he took it really well. But um, Do you ever wonder what, what Arsene Wenger could have done for you long term, though? Just with the way things progressed under him, the longevity he had, the success he had there, and the players he brought in subsequently? I do, I do. Uh, I'd be lying if I said I don't. Um, but also, if I if I stayed at Arsenal, yes, I'd have had the I'd have had the medals and I'd have played under the great Arsene Wenger with some great players. He signed an Elka, Petit, Overmars, Henri, these guys, um, and many more. But I wouldn't have had that two years I had at West Ham if I'd stayed at and, and that two years was fantastic. I was a goal behind Andy Cole for the Golden Boot. Um, I'd got 15 goals and I'd got 24 goals in the Prem, which was my best in the Premier League. And I was I was one goal behind um, Coley for the Golden Boot. And I, I, I missed four games that season. I got sent off twice. Um, Almost got them into Europe that year as well, didn't you? Yeah, they finished six, I think. But I missed the last four games, which was stupid. But I was 21. I was a bit reckless, boisterous. Didn't have the capacity, didn't have the thought process that I've got today. 
didn't have the attention span I've got today, you know, I'm older, I'm wiser. Um, but at that time, I was 21, you know, I, I was a bit of an animal on the pitch. I wanted to kick everybody, I wanted to smash everybody. But it didn't stop me from moving and big managers bought me. Big managers showed faith in me, you know, George Graham, who signed a lot of players at Arsenal, took me there, thought I was, you know, worth, worth a shout. Um, but with hindsight, which is, a, you know, an extraordinary thing, um, stay in, you know, might have been a better option. But then again, I went to West Ham and I had a great two years. We, we, we stayed up the first year. Uh, the second year, we had a really good season as well. Um, played with some really good players, you know, I watched them younger ones, as I've mentioned, uh, grow. Um, and I loved working under Harry Redknapp as well, he's a tremendous manager, he's a, he's a players manager, he's a, a motivator. And you can only tell, look at his career, you know, Spurs, Champions League, won an FA Cup at Portsmouth, did really well at Bournemouth, um, West Ham did well. So um, if I'd stayed at Arsenal, you know, I might not have had that two years. So. You make a decision at the time that you feel is right. Sometimes you don't get it wrong. I've got it wrong a few times, but the majority of the time I've got it right, I feel. Um, so I do sometimes think, you know, what if I'd stayed at Arsenal, but um, there's no point going back now, you can't change the past. We'll get back to John in a moment and find out what Harry Redknapp did to motivate him. But first, let me tell you about Who Knows Wins. If you don't know it yet, Who Knows Wins is a sports app where you challenge your friends or the community over sports results. Download the app and you can either join public leagues they have created, like the Premier League every weekend, or you can create your own custom league and invite your friends to play against you. You pick the fixtures you want to predict, the entry fee, and then pick the winning teams or go for draws for each game. The more people you have in your league, well, then the bigger the pot. All you have to do is pick the match winners or draws. You can check out all the links on our Twitter at One Last Match or just look for One Last Match on Facebook. But let's get back to Big Bad John now as he continues his One Last Match. How did you mention Harry's a motivator? How did he motivate you? What was his technique? You mentioned the way Martin kept you on track at Celtic and got you focused. What was Harry's technique to bring the best out of you? Well, he once told me that I reminded him of Jeff Hurst. Um, come off a game, I'd scored a hat trick in the cup, and I'd come in the dressing room, and he he, he said to me, John, you you were unbelievable today. He said you you were unplayable. He said you've won every header. He said you your touch was magnificent. Your your finishing was. He said and you, you remind me of Jeff Hurst, and I thought well he played with Jeff Hurst at West Ham, um, and I thought well what a compliment, do you know. Um, he said, you bring other people into play. And uh, it, it was just, Ari would just give you the confidence to go and perform. Um, training was five sides, enjoyable. And um, we had really good footballers there. As we look at Ian Bishop and John Moncur, um, you know, we, we had good players there. Uh, and um, I enjoyed my time there at West Ham. I loved playing in front of the West Ham crowd at Upton Park really vociferous crowd, passionate about their football. Um, and again, he got a lot out of me, Harry, uh, as a manager, certainly did. Mark Neal's the man who's in your dugout though. Yes. Let's get to your team. Who are you going to play in your final game, in goal? Who's number well, I'm going to play a 4-3-3. 4-3-3. I'm going to play a 4-3-3 just to get all my best players in the team. And um, Terry Orrath used to play Ian Rush, Dean Saunders. Couldn't leave Mark Hughes out. Used to play Mark Hughes in centre midfield. Mm -hmm. Couldn't leave him out, and I've got that. I've adapted that okay. same attitude. I'm not going for tactics and all. I'm going to go four-three-three. So my goalkeeper would be again. I played with David Seaman, who was magnificent. I've got to go with Neville Southall. In the 80s, he was the best keeper in the world, best keeper on the planet for Everton and Wales. What a goalkeeper! So I'd go Neville Southall in goal. If I if I had to rely on one goalkeeper to make a crucial save, it would be Big Nev. So I'm going to go Neville Southall in goal. At right back, I played with Didier Gatt at Celtic. He was rapid up and down that right. Fitness level is incredible. Um, great player. I also played with Timmy Breaker at Luton and West Ham. But I've got to go with Lee Dixon at Arsenal. Lee was solid, great defender, got forward. He'd have been brilliant in our day and age in terms of, I think he played over 600 games for Arsenal. That tells you his consistency. 
George Graham loved him. He was part of that famous back four at Arsenal, you know, where the hand would go up offside, 1-0 to the Arsenal. Um, it was Dixon, Adams, Bold, Winterburn. Um, so I'm going to go Lee Dixon. Mm -hmm. I think solid. Alongside him, I've mentioned him earlier, my captain would be Tony Adams. Um, incredible leader of men. Would have the respect of all the players. I don't think captains nowadays are that important. I think managers now want 11 captains. Mm. I don't think there's one particular guy that will go in the dressing room at half time. The players would sit down, everybody would um, not speak, and the captain would go around the dressing room addressing the players. Tony did that, and few and far between. So it would be Never South in goal, Lee Dixon right back, Tony Adams centre back. The other one I'm going to go centre back, and I don't make any apology, apologies for having three Arsenal defenders in my team because they were the best mm. and every knows they were the best. I'm going to go for my old roommate, Martin Keogh. Martin, fantastic, physical, could jump, lightning quick. Um, really good defender. If anything, Martin, you could roll him a little bit. Wasn't Didn't have the strength and the, of a Tony Adams, I didn't feel but a great defender, a brilliant character, a real big heart, wanted to win. Um, and again, Aston Villa, Everton, England, Arsenal, great career. So I'd go Dixon right back, Adams, Keown, and at left back, because my midfield is so good, I'm going to put Gary Speed in there at left back. Gary was natural left, he had two great feet, but he could hit it with his left foot and right foot. Um, and he played left back for Wales under Mark Hughes and um, he didn't make any qualms about it. Gary kept the captaincy, great guy, God rest his soul, um, terrible, terrible loss, uh, you know, to, to everybody, you know, to his family most of all, his sons and, um, you know, his parents and his family, but the football world in general as well, the clubs that he played for, you know, uh, excelled. Everton, of course, Newcastle, Leeds, Wales, um, you know, fantastic player. Um, so I'd have Gary at left back. So that's my back four. That's quite, I like the fact that you said you know, the numbers back up the Arsenal choice. No one can argue with that because they no. were the best in the business. That's right, and that's why I make no apologies, when, Mark. When, when you stepped into that, you, know, you joined when the, the kind of George Graham yeah. sort of era when they had this just ridiculous back line where they were just a machine. What was it like to step into that club and that way of doing things and the way they all were? Because it was they were just a, such a just a, a machine as they were. Well, they were, and they they functioned really well. They were all in sync. They were all mates off the off the field as well. And Nigel Winterburn is the, is the left back I've left out of that, but Nigel was a tremendous defender. He wasn't quick, but he'd he'd give the the right winger if he was quick. He'd stay like ten yards off him. And when the ball came in, he threatened to go, and he, he was never really beat. Nobody ever went past him. Um, just very clever, intelligent, played a lot of games for Arsenal, part of that famous back four. And I remember vividly, George used to keep them out. We'd all go in on a Friday afternoon after training. We'd all go and get our lunch, looking forward to the game the next day. George game never named the team, so we didn't really know. He had some sort of idea that we'd set up in training and things like that. But um, George would name it. Lunchtime the next day, we'd go for a pre-match meal about half past 11, 12 o'clock. George would name it there, and then we'd drive off to, to Highbury. Um, but I remember vividly on a Friday afternoon, and we'd all go in for our lunch, and a lot of us would just shoot off wherever we live, get some rest and everything else. The, the lads, the back four, would still be out there, and he'd work on them. It was almost like a string, you know. Um, he'd work on defensive, head in, um, being being organised and uh, he'd get one of the youth team players to whip in the crosses. So I felt sorry for that youth team <laughs> lad, whoever he was. And the lads would have their coats on and their jumpers because it would get a bit chilly in the afternoon, but they'd work on it. And that's why they got to where they got. They were famous. 1-0 to the Arsenal is the famous chant. How many games they won 1-0? You went 1-0 up for Arsenal, mm. game over. Talk about shut up shop. You weren't getting back in it. And, and, and I spoke to Kenny Daglish about this a few years ago. I did that Marina Daglish, Kenny's wife, Marina Daglish uh, appeal. And when I went in there, I think I was, we were talking, me and Kenny were having a chat about a game two or three days before. And Kenny Daglish said to me, I said, oh, I can't believe they don't see that game out. And he's like, well, John, seeing a game out is an art in itself. Mm. 
how you deal with it. Because when you're 1-0 up, 2-0 up, naturally you have a tendency to drop, to invite pressure rather than being on the front foot when you're 1-0 up, looking for a second goal to kill the, goal, the game off. doesn't normally happen that way. Sometimes teams go get a bit nervy, they drop and drop and invite pressure, do you know? Arsenal found a way to, to just see games out and they were masters at it. But it's work. It's work on the training ground and it's all that time George Graham spent with them, trusted them, won doubles, won FA Cups. That same back four hardly ever changed, you know, if it did change at all. Um, Martin obviously came into that, Martin Keown at some stage. So uh, whenever you went... 1-0 up for Arsenal, that was it. You almost say that was three points. You touched on earlier just about Tony Adams and your admiration for him as a player and as a guy mm. and what he's, what he's battled through as well. When you joined the club, it was kind of at the period where he was kind of just trying to get himself sorted. Yes. So he got kind of clean of, the, of everything, his demons mm. and stuff after that. How impressed are you with the way he sort of transitioned through that? Because you probably would have seen a little bit of both sides of, of Tony Yeah, Adams. well, I did. I, I saw the man mountain. I saw him, you know, I saw him at his best. Um, and then I saw him at his worst because I remember we turned we turned up for training one day and uh, and um, Tony got us all together at London Cole and he says, "Look, lads, can I can you just line up against the wall, please?" And um, we're all thinking, "What's happened here? Has anything you know happened?" Or, um, and he turned around and he said, "Look," he said, "I'm an alcoholic," and we're all like, you know, he said, "Then uh, I'm going to need your help." That's what he said to the lads, and he went come on let's go and train and then we just went and trained so he came out and um, it takes a bigger man to say that than to hide and to duck and dive and go be he probably got fed up of doing that over the years you know there was a there was a big there was a drink in school at Arsenal I think that's pretty public public knowledge um, and Tony just decided you know probably like a little bit like myself with the gambling um, they got a bit tired with it really, got a bit tired of telling lies and being deceitful and not being himself, not being the great man that he is, you know. Um, and that's what he did. And I remember that morning as if it was yesterday and we got on with it and training. There was a few little whispers around the group. Oh, I can't believe Tony, you know. <coughs> and I believe he's not had a drink since. So that just goes to show the strength, you know, the character, the mental strength that he has. And um, the people that he's helped you know, through getting clean himself. An inspirational man, um, do as he says and not as he did, you know. And um, I know he attends his clinic quite a lot, you know, to people that are, uh, have got problems and he's a great man, Tony. Great man, a great man to have in your team. Yeah. He's the, the guy at the centre of that defence. Who's your midfield? Well, I've gone for three across the middle. Um, I've gone, on the left, I've gone with Ryan Giggs. I can't leave Giggs out. I've played with him for 10 years with Wales. Freak of nature, um, quick. His record at Man United, most ever appearances. Um, I think he's Britain's most decorated footballer in history. 15 Premier Leagues, couple of Champions Leagues. God knows how many FA Cups, bad, League Cups, Charity <laughs> Shields. Um, sports personality of the year, players player, uh, just incredible career, a really good guy as well, Ryan. Very humble, um, doesn't say a lot, you know, just got there, did his job. Um, quite forthright in the dressing room, would say things if, if he needed to, if he needed to perk somebody up. I can see why he's gone on into management as well, now managing his country, Wales. Um, which might surprise a few people, but if you had something to say, he'd say it. Did he ever pull you up? Uh, once or twice, he'd say, "Look, John, when I'm coming down that left hand side, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, fizz it into you. I need you to get across. I need you to get in front of that defender because I'm gonna need you to hold it up, and then, you know, try and lay it off or play me in." And that I used to think to myself was, "Hold on a minute. Well, he's got cancer now, and he's got Hughes, and he's got York, he's got Cole, he's got, he's got all these great players at club level that he's playing it into. Uh, whenever he's, I'm playing, I've, I've got to step up here." Ryan's used to getting it back. Mm. He's used to Mark Hughes sticking his big thighs in and, <laughs> you know, sticking his backside into players and being that, showing your strength, you know, I'm too strong for you, you're not getting this ball, you're not getting around me, you know. So I'm thinking to myself, when Giggs is flying down that left-hand side about 80 miles an hour and he cuts inside and he goes pop into the front, I've got to be there. I can't be around the, I can't be around the back or I can't be out of position because Craig Bellamy's not going to do it. 
because Craig's not got that. He's not that mm -hmm. type of player. Craig's more of running that player. He's great ability, great player. Um, so straight away, you know, I'm thinking, so very, very rare, but there was once or twice where he'd, he'd say, look, I need you there. If I'm coming in, you need to be aware. I, I need you, you know, because you can't expect to go. He'd already beaten five. He couldn't beat six, seven, and eight. <laughs> but um, no, so as I said, he might surprise a few, but Ryan Giggs would, would be that yeah. player on, on the left. Who's the other two? The central one would be Roy Keane. Um, Roy came to Celtic for six months and um, although he was 35 and um, you know he, he was way past his best and he'd admit that himself um, it was just to play with Roy Keane at that, at that stage of my career as well um, was fantastic you could tell that he, he never gave it away never give the ball away um, and again, what surprised me a little bit, he never came in and dictated things. He never really lost his rag. I'd heard stories about what he was like at Man United, um, you know, but he had standards. And when he was on the pitch with you, you knew he was on the pitch. You knew he was there and he had great standards, you know, and his standards were, you know, um, that was the benchmark. And um, as I said, it was only six months, but um, the fact that I got to play with Roy Keane, he has to be in my team. So I have put Roy Keane um, as my middle of the three. Okay. Um, on the right-hand side, I've put in Stylian Petrov. Again, I could have put Paul Merson in there. Um, You've got Frank Lampard, Joe Cole, these Frank, kind of guys. I've got leading goal scorer for Chelsea, wonderful player. Joe Cole, what a talent. Um, but Stillian for you gets him. Stillian, because he was special. He was a special player, Stillian Petrov. Um, just his work rate, his, his heart, his guts, his desire. Uh, he had everything. And um, I think Aristo Stojkov, the greatest Bulgarian of all time, actually paid that accolade to Stan Petrov. He said, Petrov's the greatest Bulgarian. And then you think about it, you know, you had the other one then, um, you had Lechkov, mm -hmm. you had um, Berbatov. Um, Berbatov, of course, was an incredible talent. And Stillian, he's remained a great friend of mine. And um, I've only got two Celtic players in my team. Although I could have picked the whole Celtic team, I had that much admiration for them and great lads and great team brilliant five years together um, as a group so um, I have to put Stillian in he's a special player his balance um, his durability he, he's just different class Stan was that the thing about that Celtic team that it was kind of like a group it was a who kind of went thing through things together as well and as a yeah. unit was so good that that UEFA Cup run was just that's right incredible. I think I think you make a good point because our midfield was Paul Lambert who'd won a European Cup at Dortmund was Neil Lennon, who'd played a couple of hundred games under Martin O'Neill at Leicester before arriving. Neil was great, did a lot of work that people didn't appreciate. He would intercept. He was a very good passer. Again, like Roy Keane, never give the ball away. And the best players don't give the ball away. Mm. They keep it. Neil never hit it 30, 40 yards. Everything was 10 yards, 5 yards, organised in the dressing room. If you had to dish out a rollicking, he had no issues in doing that, no problem. Even if he wasn't at his best himself, which is a sign of a great captain. Um, and Stan was very much pivotal in that. Our midfield was Paul Lambert, Neil Lennon and Stan Petrov. And it would be Neil that would sit, generally. He would be the sitter, the holder. Um, and then Paul Lambert and Stillian Petrov literally worked out with their football intelligence which one would break off the front which one would go out and, and, um, and close the full back down and then Lambert would come around, Lennon would come around. It was just like a, you know, just everything was in motion. And uh, Stillian was fantastic and uh, he was part of that great team that I played in. So, might surprise a few people, but Stillian Petrov for me gets the nod. I think Petrov gets in, you've got three up top, you're one of them. Yes. So you're I'm, in. I'm central because okay. I've got to play. I wouldn't put myself in there, by the way. Um, but. You've said I have to. So I'm central um, because I have to be that, that middle man who doesn't do an awful lot of running. I have to be there. Um, and alongside me, I'd have the two greatest players I've ever, ever shared a pitch with, which is Dennis Bergkamp and Henrik Larsson. 
So that would be my team. It would be four, three, three. It would be Giggs, Keane, Petrov, and then I'd have Bergkamp, myself, and Larson. Now remember, I've left out Ian Wright. I've left out Rush, Hughes, Saunders. I've left out um, Chris Sutton. I've left out Bellamy. So I can only pick 11. I can pick three teams. Um, so I think that's quite a good team. I was going to say, you really, we, we were kind of throwing through the names before we, we recorded this and look at the guys you played up front with, the guys mm. you played midfield with. And yeah. it, it, it was impossible to try and pick pick a, pick a three or pick a, you know, pick a couple together. The guys you've picked, you, you touched about Henrik before, Dennis Bergkamp, just a, was he a guy who, who did things you couldn't explain? Yeah, I, he did things I couldn't do. <laughs> <laughs> he did things nobody could do. But um, Dennis was just, um, well, he, he was just phenomenal. His touch, his balance. Um, if you look at the, the greatest, Dennis Bergkamp's 100 great goals, everyone is a goal of the season contender. Every one of his goals, you could put down, what's goal of the season that? where he just shifts onto one side, his back to goal, just knowing where he is, his vision, is linking up with Henri. You know, you look at Thierry Henri's goals on Premier League, Dennis Bergkamp sliding him in with that perfect weight of pass, which I think is not appreciated enough, the weight of the pass mm. into a forward. If the defender's there, play it there. Good players do that. Don't make it a fight ball for me, you know, Football intelligence. Um, Dennis used to pass the ball to you as if he was passing it to his granny. That's how much care he had on, on this pass, you know. And some of the goals that he used to score, volleys, technically incredible. And I could say equally the same for Henrik Larsson. Great finisher, 250 goals in 315 games for Celtic. Record goal scorer for his country. Um, phenomenal. You know, on that UEFA Cup run, we lost to Jose Mourinho's Porto in 2003, I think it was, 2005, missed the final, unfortunately. Um, scored two goals in the final, scored the winning goal in the semi-final against Boa Vista um, away, a game that I played in. <coughs> uh, and he was, he was incredible, Henrik. Um, they call him the king up here in Scotland, in Glasgow in particular. Um, I've never seen a player idolised and worshipped by a fan base as much as Henrik Larsson is worshipped by the Celtic fans. The appreciation they have for him is incredible. Very humble guy, um, you know, nice guy, chats away. Um, you know, you never think, you know, he uh, he scored all them goals. He's very, you know, he doesn't go on how good he was or nothing like that. Um, and that would be my team, and I think uh, I think that's quite a good team. It's quite a good team. A tremendous record alongside Henrik and Stillian as part of that, that Celtic group who were in there. I just wonder, at the start of this, we picked your match to play and you picked a game with Wales. Were you tempted to pick an old firm game at all? And how did you find those when you first came? I think you won your first one, but then some of the games that the rest of that season, there was a sending off later in your first season in one of those fixtures. Yes. How did you find those matches? Great games. That's one of the reasons why I came to play for Celtic. I wanted to experience that. I heard so much about it, you know, the old firm game. Um, Celtic Rangers, one of the biggest derbies in the world. What it means to the two supporters is um, is like nothing else, really. Um, you know, for the next three months, if you've lost one, you can't wait for the next one, you know. You don't want to get your head off the pillow when you lose one. You don't want to face the fans, you don't want to face the staff at the club. You don't want to face your teammates, the manager, you just feel as if you let every down. That game is for the supporters and the supporters only. Not for you, it's for the fans. You know, they are the games that they are desperately wanting to win. They've got to go to work the next day, in the offices, in the workplaces, on the building sites. And it's bragging rights. It's, it's having that Mickey taken out of you. It's, it's having that feeling good for that next three or four months till the next one. Um, that that you, first scene, you pretty much everything. Cause you, you won the first one, yeah. so there was a sending off, there was a Lovencrans Cup final. Once you had all the kind of emotions in that, yeah. could you get your head around the, the different ones in that first scene? Well, I'd scored, I'd scored, I scored nine goals against Rangers. I scored the winning goal in four consecutive derbies. Um, so I'd had, I'd had a good time against them. You know, you get the keys to one half of the city <laughs> if you get the winning goal. Um, and I actually scored 11. I scored two goals that were 
good goals, perfectly good goals, ruled out for offside. So 11 sounds better than nine, you know. Um, so I, I actually did well in uh, the Celtic Rangers games. I loved going to Ibrox, really, you know, uh, intimate stadium, noisy. Fans are just on you, giving you all sorts of abuse and stick and everything else. Um, but I loved that. I got the winning goal there a few times, you know, and it's a great feeling. It's a great feeling now when we, when we got the games as well, having achieved what I did against uh, Celtic's biggest rivals. Um, and we felt during that five years, we had the Indian sign over them, certainly. We won more games than we lost. And they had a decent side then as well. They had Stefan Kloss in goal and Amoruso and Arthur Newman, Craig Moore, the Australian centre-back, Barry Ferguson, Ronald De Boer, Avaladzi, um, Lovenkrantz, <coughs> these type of players. So they had a good side under uh, Alec McLeish. But um, I just felt, and you could look at the records, I don't know, but uh, off the top of my head, I, I just feel that we won more games than than, than we lost. Um, and it was a great period because you look at next to you in the Celtic dressing room, and as I said, I've got Sutton and I've got Larson and I've got Petro, I've got Lambert, I've got Yo Albi who's going to attack the ball from, from a set piece. You know, I've got Didier Gat that'll make me a chance. I've got Alan Thompson that'll make me a chance. And you're in the dressing room, you're thinking, we have to play bad today. We have to let in a poor goal if we're going to get beat. You know, because you look around the dressing room, and I'm sure other players would say in that dressing room, you get to trust each other, you get to know each other's roles and your responsibilities. And um, when you look around that Celtic dressing room, even when you're at Ibrox in the away team dressing room, you're going out in the tunnel and you come up face to face with the opposition and you fancy yourself because of the, the, the men and the, the players you had around you. Brilliant team you were a part of. You picked a brilliant team. The final option I give you for your team, you can pick one opposition player you played against for club or country you think would enhance your team, you could drop in to add to the group. Who would you pick? You played against some phenomenal players. I could list them all yeah, all day. Um, I'd have to say, I'd have to say, again, we went to Barcelona and drew. We actually won in Barcelona as well. Um, You've scored there. They scored the, the goal there in the Champions League, yeah. I was half a yard offside, but <laughs> make up for the ones that I wasn't given. But um, it's quite funny that was because Eto got their goal. Samuel Eto got their goal. There's 95,000 fans there at the new Camp. And my dad took a picture of the scoreboard, Hearts and Eto. And the next morning he's, he's in, having a breakfast in the cafe in Swansea. And he's showing all his mates, look what I was last night. My, bo <laughs> my boys scored a goal in Barcelona and all that. You know, my dad loves it. Um, but again, you look at it, you know, I've played against Ronaldo, uh, Messi, Rooney, all the big ones, and even the centre-halves. When I, when, I, when I was a young boy at Arsenal, 19, I came into the Super Cup final and I played in the San Siro, played in AC Milan twice. Um, played at uh, the, the San Siro three or four times, actually. Wales, Italy, Celtic, AC Milan, Arsenal, AC Milan. Um, if I had to say one player, I think I'd choose a defender and I'd say Franco Baresi. I never got a kick for two games and I was young, I was boisterous, I was a good size. He was just class act, just a class act. If I tried to hold him and tried to sort of, you know, physically ruffle him and roll him, he'd just push me away. I didn't know where he was, he'd just stick his foot through my legs and get the ball, he'd come round the side and he'd nick it away and wasn't the biggest, quite slight, but you know, on his toes all the time. If you watch Baresi, um, the great Franco Baresi won doubles at AC Milan and the Capello, an Italian great. Um, but I could say, I could go back to Adams, you know, I could say lots and lots of players. Um, but I'll go Franco Baresi, because <coughs> I don't think he let you down defensively, so I'll go Franco Baresi, if I could we, add one player to that team. I think we'll uh, struggle to find a better wild card that anybody picks over Franco Baresi. Final question then to wrap things up, but you've kind of answered this at the start in some ways. I always ask everyone if there was one moment of the, of the career or life they would change at this point. You've mentioned a game that you would change, but beside that, are you content and is your outlook kind of different now? Because you've gone through so much post-football, mm. you've had to endure and recover, you know, 
everyone knows your story of what you went through physically. Yeah. Are you, have you got a different outlook, do you think, now? You don't have that kind of... Massive different outlook now. I've got a different perception of things. You know, I appreciate the nice weather. I appreciate um, time with my children. Um, I'm in a great place now, and, and cancer has totally changed me, totally changed me altogether. It's made me a bit calmer, um, family times, walking along the beach with my kids, and these little things that, you know, so nearly got taken away from me, you know. It's very, very close to losing my battle, stop breathing, uh, eyes rolling at the back of my head. At one stage, I was in desperate trouble. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it takes a lot to come out of the hospital and to go back to the way, you know, it, when, you've, when you've come so near, um, when you've touched the other side, if you like. Um, I went to a very dark place at one stage and, uh, you know, you'd have to be an idiot to go back to the way you were, really. I think, um, you know, I'm not naive enough now to, to think that, you know, putting myself under pressure, um, you know, with the gambling and everything else. And um, But thinking about myself too much now, I'm putting myself before, it, you know, I used to think about myself all the time. I only thought about one person when I played, and that was me. You know, but now you've got family. Um, uh, it's all about my children. It's all about my wife uh, going forward, staying healthy, uh, financially being in a, in a stable position, um, and just enjoying life, really. Um, and that's where I am now, and, and I'm in a good place. I've got plenty of work on. I work with the media. Um, you know, I enjoy the television. I really enjoy the uh, the pressure of having to call it and call it right um, because of social media. If you don't call it right, <laughs> you know yourself, Mark, you know, you can come under a bit of pressure. But um, no, things have worked out for me very well and uh, I'm in a good place now. It's fabulous to see you so content, so happy. Um, brilliant to listen to you today. Fabulous career. We hope we've given you the perfect final match to round it all off. Uh, brilliant. That is all for this episode. Remember, it is never too late for one last match. Brilliant stuff from John there. What a team John Hartson has just put together. Uh, thanks very much for listening. Uh, just a quick reminder to get involved with Who Knows Wins. It's the new app that really is shaking the sports entertainment industry. Uh, you can challenge your mates for real money and, of course, more importantly, bragging rights. Uh, this is what Who Knows Wins is all about. Download the app, you create your league, you select your fixtures across football, rugby, tennis or horse racing, and you set your entry stake, you make your predictions, you invite your pals in and challenge them to be your predictions. You grow that pot and then win the money. But when it comes to the bragging rights, of course, winner takes all. Get it on the App Store or in Google Play now. Who knows wins? You put your money where your mates are. And while you're downloading it, make sure you rate, review and subscribe to One Last Match, where next week, our guest will be ex-Liverpool and Ireland midfielder Jason McAteer. Remember, it is never too late for one last match. Audio Frontier.